will fade, but I found my hope in you. You are the one I want, you are the one I need.
worship service this morning. If you're joining us online, thank you as well. We're glad you're here. If you're a guest, thank you for coming. Thank you for worshiping with us. You belong here. Today's our back to school service. We're very excited. We've got some exciting things planned. We've got the Howards here today with us to worship and to minister. We're thankful for that. Excited. If you're here and you have not given your name to uh, brother and sister Josh and Christina, uh, please give me your name. We have some giveaways that we're doing today for the Sunday school kids, for the youth, as well as online. So if you're not able to be here and you're watching, please comment, throw a thumbs up, do something so we know you're here, your kids are here, so we can put their names in. And they can hopefully win something. Amen. Do we have any specific needs or any prayer requests that you want to mention or if you'd like to come down front and have the pastors anoint you and pray with you. We'd love to do that right now as we open up our service. Jesus. Yes, please keep Brother Tom in your prayers this week as well. Please keep uh, Sister Angela's mother in your prayers as well. She's getting back to full health and 100% and recovered. to worship you, to partake in the things of God, to be able to come together and to see the miraculous hand, Lord, to see you move today, Father. We thank you for that now. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for being our King. Thank you for being our Lord. Thank you for your hand of provision. Thank you for your covering of authority and protection. Thank you for your love, Father. In the name of Jesus, we lift up each and every need in this place right now, Lord, that your will would be done in each and every situation, that your kingdom would come and be made manifest, that your name would be glorified, and your kingdom would grow through each and every need in each and every situation that we've spoken, that is unspoken, Lord, that you know we need, Father. We lay aside every weight. We cast every care on you, Father. We give up complete control, Lord, because you said that we can do nothing without you, Lord. We know that your word is true. We know that your word is forever settled. We know that you would care and you would provide better than we ever could. I pray over each and every person in this place, Father. I pray that you would send forth your peace right now. You would send forth your strength, a sound mind in Jesus' name. Your boldness and confidence over each and every person that's participating and that's leading in worship, leading in prayer, leading in the ministry of the word. In Jesus' name, Father, I pray your grace mercy and peace over each and every person under the sound of my voice. Lord, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Give us a heart ready to receive your word. Lord, I pray that your spirit of wisdom and revelation would go forth right now in the name of Jesus, that you would give us the fullness of your understanding. Lead us into all truth in Jesus' name. And we thank you for it now, Father. Hallelujah. Come on, let's bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise in this place. Hallelujah, Jesus. Oh. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? 
Well, I, I hear them, but I don't know if I hear. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord? Yes. Okay, amen. Hallelujah. We're going to kind of take it back. This is a song that we haven't done in forever and a day. But I'm pretty sure y'all going to remember it, and I'm going to need y'all to go with us, okay? All right. <laughs>
bless his name. How many of y'all came to bless his name this morning? I know there's a lot of uncertainties out there, a lot of things that we don't know of yet. But one thing we can be certain of, that we serve a great God. We serve a great God, right? And he sits on his throne with all power in his hands. Hallelujah. We love this morning. Hallelujah. We're going to bless his name. Y'all's hands together like this.
this morning. I will wait on you. Come on.
me sing it if you believe it. Come on, do it again. Come on, everybody. I will wait on you. I will wait on you. Come on, put those hands in the air. I'm going to wait on you, oh God. I will wait on you. I will trust in you. I will trust in you, Lord. your neighbor. If you don't see them singing, shake them for a second. Tell them open up your mouth.
Lord, I believe I'm among a people today that trust in the God that we serve, that he will never let you down, he will never forsake you, he will never fail you, and it, even, it doesn't even matter what it looks like all around you. The song said that uh, the storm might be raging all around me, but the storm is not in me, because the God of, the God of peace, the God of angel armies lives inside of me, and I've got that hope and that confidence in him. I was thinking of that scripture this morning that said the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and I was thinking when I was dwelling on that scripture I was like but God there's no one good how how is it that that I can be good and have my steps ordered by you but Proverbs tells us that if any man would to trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding but in all of your ways acknowledge him the Bible says that he will direct your path how am I good in the Lord? How are my steps ordered? By my obedience and by my surrender, by my faith in Him, by my trust in Him. I can remain confident in Him no matter what it looks like around me because I trust in Him. Do I got a witness in the house today that just trusts in God? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is so good, City Church. We are so excited to be here today uh, at our back to school service. We're so excited to have our visiting minister and his family here with us today. We're so excited for all the young people that have come out to join us. Why don't you go ahead and give them a hand? Praise the Lord. God is so good. God is so good. We, guess what guys, we, you, when you walked in the door, we gave all of you a, a raffle ticket. We wanted to just give back a little bit, give you something to be excited about looking, looking forward to school with. Something that you could go and maybe, I don't know, maybe buy a little something that you want. Maybe your mom and dad might dictate what you can buy. Maybe you'll, you'll, you'll be one of the lucky ones that dictates what you get to get. But we wanted to give you a little bit of something today. So we're gonna start, if my wife would come, uh, Sister Christina, why don't y'all give her a hand. to start with the older youth today and we are going to just pull it random okay there's no favorites here you're all equal in the eyes of God we're just going to pull it random so we're going to start with the older youth and everybody gets your tickets ready if you were given a ticket when you came in in the door just go ahead and get them ready get that number good and memorized we're going to shake it up a little bit build the anticipation to go to commercial break. We'll be right back. No, I'm just joking. You ready? You guys ready? You guys ready? This is for $5 million. Are you ready? <laughs> That's a joke. Okay. <laughs> you ready? Here you go. Read it off for him. 996-557. Five, five, Got it. All right. Come on up. Give her a hand. Come on up. All right. Everybody give her a hand. She won a $25 Visa gift card. Congratulations. Congratulations. All right. We're going to move real quick to the, to the elementary ages. This is ages 4 through 11. So if you're between the ages of 4 through 11, get your ticket out. We're going to get ready to call it. We're going to shake it up real good. Shake it real good. Give it a good shake. Holy Ghost shake. Anybody got a Holy Ghost shake in the house? Come on, shake with me. All right, here we go. Here we go. No looking. Nine, nine, six, six, eight, six. Yeah. All right. Yeah, y'all give him a hand. Come on. Now, that's the way you come into church. He kicked in the door and took the prize. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, guys, now, since we're in this kind of difficult time where not everybody could be with us, we have also decided to do an online raffle, okay? So there's, there's been some people that have commented through YouTube or Facebook, and we wanted to go ahead and enter them in because they have children that are going back to school as well. Now, for our young people that were here, they got a $25 gift card, a Visa gift card. For the ones that are online, we're going to be emailing you a uh, $25 Amazon gift card. So, if you're ready, come on, show some excitement like they're in the house today. They're watching and joining with us. Come on, shake it up. They, look, they got a big box. All right. Let's see who it is. We have Kiana Young. Woo! All right. Congratulations to Sister Kiana Young. All right, I know that they're going to be able to use that. 
I'm going to get out of the way real quick. My wife's going to give you a couple Sunday school announcements. God bless you guys. We love you. Praise the Lord, church. That was fun. Um, just a quick recap. Um, next, we were supposed to kick off Sunday school next week, but due to the spikes in COVID and um, following what our school districts are doing, we decided to push back just a little bit, not too much, but just a little bit. Um, like my husband said, we want to make sure we do things the right way. So our new reopening date is September 27th. Mark your calendar, September 27th. We are going to try to push for that date. We are going to kick it off in the fellowship hall. We'll practice social distancing, and um, we're going to have a really good time. We can't wait to all gather together. It's going to be an exciting time. God bless you all. <laughs> Yes, sir. And if you want to, after service, feel free to take a careful trip down the hallway, down the Sunday school wing. Our mural artist has been hard at work. She's got a lot completed, and it looks really good, you guys, really good. We are so excited. We're going to go ahead and turn this over to Sister Brianna Allen. She comes and gives you guys the announcements. Hi, guys. It's so weird to have your voice across the whole thing. Um, so I just have announcements and everything. Um, so for Thursday night Bible study and prayer, it is every Thursday at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary and online. Um, this is going to be our last lesson of Eat This Book Bible Study, so get in while you can. It's actually been really, really interesting and helpful. So you can view all lessons online at the church's YouTube channel and Facebook page. Um, next, I want to thank all the volunteers who helped at the community blessings on Saturday. So those who participated, please stand so we can be rec so you can be recognized. Yeah. Yes, thank you guys so much. I'm going to ask Sir Sean Gilliard to come up and give us a report about the community blessing event. Good morning, everybody. I would first like to say thank you to everyone that came out and volunteered and helped make this event a success on yesterday. I would also like to thank everyone that came out and helped us canvas the neighborhoods. And also to you all that donated and helped to make this a success as far as the things that we were able to give out on yesterday. Um, yesterday, City Church of Charleston and Favor Foundation got together and we did a community blessing event where we gave out book bags and groceries for families in need. We gave out, it was, we had over 50 bags um, of book bags filled with school supplies to give out. And as of now, they're all accounted for. So we've given out over 50 book bags filled with school supplies. And we've also given out over 50 bags of groceries, which is able to feed a family of four for a couple of days. So give yourselves a hand. I believe that we will see the goodness of the Lord, and I believe that we should show that goodness of the Lord. So as the CEO of Favor Foundation, as a member of City Church of Charleston, I am just, I'm sorry, I am so passionate about this, you guys. I'm challenging each and every one of us to be the church, to show the goodness of the Lord, to show the love of the Lord. And even if you don't have it to give a can of grocery or give something, a book bag, a dollar, even if you don't have that, you can give a smile or a kind word. Amen? So from this day forward, I challenge each and every one, be the church. Go make disciples. Show the love of Christ because we are the only Bibles that some people may see. Amen? Thank you. backpack blessing so thank you to everyone who contributed to our annual backpack blessing um, there were at least 30 backpacks full of school supplies that were donated so thank you guys give yourselves a round of applause for all of your generosity okay 
And next is our evangelist, Mike Easter, who is joining us Sunday, August 23rd at 11 worship service. 11 a.m. worship service. We're excited to have an evangelist with us this Sunday. Bring a guest, invite someone, tug them in, tow them in, um, and let's or watch the service online. We expect God to do great things. And that's all I have. <laughs> Next is Jordan. school or a youth or young adult, would you stand up? Also, if you're in school, so <clears throat> my first year of community college, my mom was going to class as well, too, so it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be under the age of 21 or something. Let's give them another hand. This service is about them, right? Let's celebrate them. Thank you again for joining us. Um, if you're here every week or this is your first time, we're glad you're here. If you're watching online, if you're watching this recorded 10 years from now, we're really glad you joined us. Um, we appreciate you worshiping with us. I am excited to uh, introduce uh, a new friend that um, we've met a few times at different district events, but have never really had in-depth conversations or been able to hang out. Um, I know our wives have, and obviously... Being here growing up in Charleston, my wife has met their family, but been able to spend uh, all day yesterday with this family. Um, I'm excited to say we have new friends, or I have new friends at least, and uh, JJ has uh, a new best friend. But to be able to just to talk with you guys and to see your heart and to see what you guys are doing for your, your church and, and what you guys care about and what you just the spirit you brought for this service. I'm extremely excited. I'm extremely thankful as well, too. So I have a little bio. And if you didn't know this, like myself, again, we, we really just, over the last two months, really got to, to meet and got to know him yesterday. But he's actually been coined as the most interesting man in the world. Um, you know, I have a German shepherd, so I know this firsthand. But he actually once taught a German shepherd to bark in Spanish. Pretty crazy. He once, and we've all been there, had an awkward moment, right? He once had an awkward moment just because he wanted to see how it felt. It's amazing. His mom actually, most, I didn't know this until this morning, but his mom actually has a tattoo that says son. No, but seriously, you guys are a beautiful family. You guys are awesome people. Um, actually, again, before we met, um, Pastor talked uh, about your parents and, and your guys' parents a lot and how just how loved you guys are and how loved they are. So you guys are in great hands this morning. I believe that. A little about Brother Howie and, and their family. Brother Howie was filled with the Holy Ghost when he was seven years old. Um, they both grew up in church and have been a part of the, the body for a long time. Um, they met actually through Bible quizzing when they were 13 years old. They're originally from California before they moved to South Carolina. They have two awesome boys, Aiden and Carter. Um, and as I said yesterday, uh, JJ made, made some new best friends, so we, ha we had a blast. Um, they have been to over, on over seven mission trips, four different countries, and have witnessed the miracles and the power of God all over this earth. Uh, Brother Howie is a licensed UPCI minister, the, the uh, organization that we're a part of. They are associate pastors in Pendleton, South Carolina for the past four years, and we're in section three of the district, but they're actually section one uh, youth directors, so um, as you come up here, uh, let's give him a hand and welcome him. We also have a little gift for you guys and a thank you, so. Thank you. Amen. You know, Psalm 34 verse one says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Anybody feel like that today? Amen. When times are good, he is worthy of praise. But even when times are bad, he is worthy of praise. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Jordan, for that. I do want to clarify. My wife was not with me when I went on those mission trips as we were not married yet. So before you start going in asking her about how awesome, you know, what was it like she will tell you she has absolutely no idea. I had been on those before marriage, and now the marriage, I think, is a new mission trip. So that is 
where we are right now. But God is so good. He is amazing. It is, uh, my wife and I were thinking back to the very first time we had ever been to Charleston. I, I encourage you, don't be fooled by somebody that's up here dressed nice. This is only the second time I've ever even worn this suit. So don't be like, man, this guy has it all together. You know, he's up there and he's talking and, and all of this stuff. The very first time we had ever even come to Charleston, my son was three years old. And we, uh, we came out here. We wanted to take him to the aquarium. He's nine now. And, and we didn't even have enough for both of us, my wife and I, to go into the aquarium with my son. Like, you want to talk about broke. Like, we were broke. So it was like rock, paper, scissors. Looks like I'm taking Aiden into the aquarium and you're waiting in the car. Uh, but you fast forward and here we are today. Charleston is just such a beautiful city. Uh, this building, just such a beautiful building. And more importantly, there was just such a beautiful spirit of the Lord that was moving in this place. I can't, I can't contain it. If you see me get a little crazy and I'm done dancing and I'm jumping, I'm shouting, you have no idea my testimony, what I've been through, what my wife has been through. And all I can say is that through brokenness, through her, through pain, God will absolutely blow your mind. He is so good and so awesome. If you have your Bibles, you could turn with me to John chapter 6. Beginning at verse number 5, John chapter 6, beginning at verse number 5. And they are putting it up there as well where you can follow along. But it says this. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Verse 6, And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip, verse 7, answered him, 200 pennyworth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, verse 8, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here, everybody say lad, which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Jump ahead with me to verse number 13. In the meantime, Jesus has them sit down. Verse 13. Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So he told them, why don't you go gather everything? And, and they went and gathered everything, and they had 12 baskets left over. Now jump with me to Romans chapter 12 and verse number 3. Romans 12, 3. I want to focus... On the very last sentence of that particular passage, it says, According as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Everybody say measure. Amen. Hey man, look over to your neighbor and say, A little bit is all I've got. That's right. Now look over to your other neighbor and say, A little bit is all you need. That's right. By the help of the Lord, I'm going to be preaching from that simple thought. A little bit is all I've got. A little bit is all I've got. Again, I want to just say how excited that we are to be here in Charleston. I was so excited. And hanging out with Jordan and, and the Pharisees, they're just awesome. I hope you guys know how blessed that you are. I mean, they are absolutely awesome folks. Great leadership, great musicians. Everything was just so awesome. I was so excited of being in Charleston yesterday that we went out and eat at this place called Vicious Biscuit. Anybody ever hear of a place called Vicious Biscuit? It is a good place. You know, they, they talk about biscuits that are so good it makes you want to slap your mama. Like, that is a place where you've got to tell mama, like, slide on down. You know, like, you better, yep, scoot aside because I'm about to take this bite. So it was, it was a delicious place. My wife tells me what she wants, and she, uh, she lets me know as I get up there. And I'm in line with Brother Jordan, and we're ordering. And, and she says, hey, make sure this is what you get the boys. So I get up there. Just so excited. You know, this place is so cool. And I order my plate. I think it was the old-fashioned breakfast or whatever it is. And, and you know, my sons, they wanted what it is that they wanted. And a munchkin platter or something to that effect. So I got one for my son, got one for my other son. And we're just pumped up. We're excited. We go sit down at our table. And they're bringing out all of this food, delicious food. And we're there. And I'm not going to eat yet. Brother Jordan's got his. My boy's got his. Uh, Sister Livy did not have hers yet. And Sarah did not have hers yet. And so the waitress comes out, and she says, is there anything else? Jordan's like, yeah, I think there's a couple more that we're waiting for. And, and it hit me. It hit me at that point. I looked at my wife, and I said, baby, what did you want? And she said, I want a bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit. I said, they're not going to bring that out. I forgot. 
So Jordan was so sweet. He said, listen, if you need a ride back to the hotel, like, I've got you. So, so that was nice. My wife did end up sharing with the boys. So before you're like, I feel so bad. She didn't eat. And it also cost me a new pair of shoes. So she did also get a new pair of shoes. So don't feel too terrible for her. Amen. So go ahead and jump with me to verse 5 again of John chapter 6, verse 5. I'm going to kind of focus on a couple of these scriptures, and we're going to hit on a couple different stories throughout. But I believe that God has a word for the church that is here today. Amen? I believe that there is somebody here. Nobody was here by accident. Nobody was here and just happened to stumble across. But God knew exactly who is going to be here today. And I believe that he's got something for you. It says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Now, I love Jesus. Like, he is just, like, he literally, like, just blows people's mind. You know, I mean, all the different stories that you read about him. He is just so, so awesome. You take a look, and there was one of the Pharisees. You know, they come, and they try to trick Jesus. And they're like, hey, should we pay tribute to Caesar? Like, is that something that we should do? Uh, and he's like, well, why don't you take a coin? Look at the coin. Whose face do you see on that coin? And they're like, well, we see Caesar's. He says, well, then render unto Caesar what Caesar's. And they're like, man, we totally thought that we were going to trap him. So then you take a look at the Sadducees. And the Sadducees then try to trick Jesus. And they are, these are two different sects of that day that were, you know, their, uh, you know, their own little religious groups that they believed each one was the right one and stuff. And the Sadducees are like, I think we can trick Jesus. And so they say, hey, let me ask you something. If there was a man and a wife that were married and the husband dies... And the wife marries the brother of the husband, and then he dies, and she marries another brother, and they're going through this line, and, and he said, when they get to heaven, whose wife will she be? They're like, we've got him. We're totally going to trick him now. And she's like, if you guys even read the scripture, totally calls him out. He said, you would know that they don't even get married in heaven. And so they're like, man, we totally thought that we were going to get him. And, and again, you know, that wasn't it. And so he, he totally just, just tricked him like it is that he does, and then there is another story, and the high priests and the elders now come to Jesus, and they say, I think we can trick him. And so they come up to him, and they say, hey, Jesus, we, you know, we, we do believe that you are God. Let me, let's ask you this. By, by what authority do you do these miracles and these healings? Who, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus says, well, let me ask you my own question. By what authority was, was John's baptism? Was it something that was of heaven or was it something that was of man? And they were over there, these high priests and their elders are like, just give us a minute. They start huddling and they're like, man, if we say that it's of heaven, then he's going to call us out in front of all of these people and say, well, then why didn't you believe him? But then if we say that, well, that was of men, then all of these people here who believe John are going to stone us because they're going to be upset. So they said, well, we can't answer you. He said, well, then neither am I going to answer you. Like, that's just how Jesus was. You know, like, he's just, he's just awesome. So we see right here in this particular verse, he looks at Philip and he says, whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Like, hey, where, where can we buy some food for these people? Now, to give you context, there was 5,000 men, okay? There was children and women on top of that. So it's safe to assume there was probably 10,000 people that were there. And he's asking Philip, hey, where can we buy bread for these people? Go ahead and go to the next verse real fast. Because then we kind of see... Uh, Philip's response, and, and again, this lets us know how Jesus was just messing with him. I told you, Jesus messed with people. And he says, and this he said to prove him or to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Now go, let's see, uh, let's see Philip's response. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. He says, Jesus, if we worked for six months, and this is the, the equation, the equal of 200 penny worth of that day. If we had six months of savings, if we worked for six months and we kept all that money, we still would not even have enough to give everybody even a little. I'm not talking about even filling them up. I'm talking about to even give them where they all may take just a little. We'll go ahead and put up the next verse. We see something. One of his disciples... Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, says something unto him. So Jesus is now asked Philip, Philip, where can we get bread for them? Where can we get something to eat? The disciples are like, you know, Jesus, this is like there's way too many people. Like really we should probably just tell them to go back home, 
tell them to go get something to eat, tell them that it's just, there's just too much uh, for us to feed them. And Andrew kind of comes in, which was Peter's brother, and they were fishermen. There's, there was, uh, there's Peter and there was Andrew. Those were brothers. And then there was James and John. They were other brothers and partners in the fishing business. And so Andrew comes in, and, and he says, you know, hey, he went out there, you know, looking for some food. I'll see if I can find anything uh, just to let Jesus know, like, really, like, there is not enough money here. There's not enough food here. There's nothing here. And so go ahead and, uh, yep, there it is right here. The next verse, it says, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? So Andrew comes, and he wants to show Jesus, like, Jesus, listen, we're not trying to be smart with you when we're saying that, you know, 200 penny worth, six months worth of money isn't enough to feed them. We're just trying to tell you, like, we've looked, and nobody's got any food. Like, we've, we've checked, and there, there, there's nobody. But look, I want, I want to show you. We did try. You know, we did go out there, and we did try to find some food or to see what anybody had, and there is a lad here. So he, he wants to point out to Jesus like there is just a lad like this is just a young kid like this is you know this is an insignificant boy it's not even a a man and he continues which have five barley loaves like Jesus again I want to point out to you that these loaves which keep in mind these weren't like big loaves these were more like small like pita bread kind of size loaves are made of barley these are barley loaves so Jesus not only did I find some young insignificant little person right here that said they've got something but I took a look at what they had and they were five barley loaves barley was that that was from those that were poor they couldn't even afford wheat so they would use barley so Jesus again I want to remind you that not only did I find somebody that was small and insignificant but the loaves that they have are pretty small and insignificant Significant. It's not even wheat. You know I'm allergic to barley. Like, I don't even like barley. So I'm just letting you know, Jesus, like, these are barley loaves also, you know. So, and then he continues, like, Jesus, in case you don't see that this kid is small and insignificant, and the small little loaves that he has are insignificant and personally gross, then look what else he has. He has two small fishes. Jesus, you know when you called me, I was on the boat. Like, I know how to fish. I know what the big fish look like because I caught a bunch of them. I, I told you that story, the one that got away. These are small fish. Like, if anybody could tell you how big or small the fish were or, or great they were, I'm telling you, these are small fish. Like, he even wants to make sure Jesus knows. You're not an insignificant boy, small, just, you know, just nothing, little loaves, uh, barley loaves, and then two small fish. And Jesus is there, and, he, and again, we see that, uh, that Andrew is there saying, what, what are they among so many? At six years of age, my son Aiden, who is here today, and won a gift card. Thank you for that. We didn't even have to pay or beg or plead or, you know, let him know how, you know, how broke we were and we needed a gift card or nothing. I mean, so that was awesome. So, uh, so my son, at six years of age, there was a vacation Bible school that was happening there in Anderson, South Carolina. And we had told him he knew that he was going to be going. The date was August 8th, 2017. And Aiden came and told me. He said, Daddy, and he told his mama too. He said, Daddy, I want you to know that I was praying and I felt God. And I feel I'm going to get the Holy Ghost today. Six years of age. When you're a parent, I mean, it's just, you just want to cry. Like, baby, let's pray. Like, let's pray. And so, uh, sure enough, we, we go to vacation Bible school. My wife was... Uh, was still pregnant at the time. She was miserable. Her feet, you know, you know how they get and everything. And, and they, she just hit her to even walk and get up. And she says, you go. But if he gets the Holy Ghost, like, you better let me know. Okay, you better video it. You better FaceTime me. And so sure enough, we go out there and at the vacation Bible school. And Aiden goes to the front. And sure enough, he got filled with a gift of the Holy Ghost. With the evidence of speaking in tongues. He was just there and there was nothing that was pushed, nothing that was forced. There wasn't any words that were being whispered to him to tell him what to say. But the Spirit of God began to touch him and flow through him. And verse 13, go ahead and put verse 13 up. It tells us right here, Therefore they gathered them together. And they filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. Now, I don't know about you, but that just absolutely blows my mind that this insignificant boy that didn't have much, that these small little barley loaves that weren't made of much, that these two small fish that really wasn't enough to even probably get that boy full, that it, when Andrew and the disciples are going through and looking, if anybody has anything, 
that there was one little boy that says, hey, a, a little bit is all I've got. I, I've got just something small. I've got something little. And you think about the story that had to have played out before that. A mom that loved her boy but was really broke and they didn't have much money. She says, baby, I, I know you want to go follow Jesus, so I'm going to just make you a little something. And, and here's just a couple little loaves and fish and make sure you stretch it out. But when all of these people were starving and hungry, this little boy totally could have just ate it. No doubt he was hungry too. If you've got kids, you know those things are like little monsters. Like they don't stop eating. They just keep eating, keep eating. We were in the back. Right now, like right before service, we're in the back, and there's like a box of little goodies that, that, that Pastor Ferris and then provided, and, and it was great. And before we could stop my son, he was there taking a bite of every single one of them. We're like, what are you doing? Like, that's kids. Like, that's just what they do. Like, they're going to eat everything that's there. So here was this little boy, and instead of eating these small little loaves, instead of eating these fish that had no doubt been dried and ready to eat, he, he pipes up and he says, hey, I, I've got something. It's, it's little. It, it's all that I've got. And, and, and he's there and, and the, the, what must have been going through his mind. And if I can help, if there's anything that I can do. And his mama, you know, told him before, well, just remember, we don't have much. You've got to stretch it out. And yet he was willing to give what little bit that he had. And put it in the hands of Jesus. So what blows my mind is in verse 13. When they gather all of the leftovers, all of the pieces, and there was 12 baskets left over. Think about the story that that little boy had when he went back to his mama and said, Mama... You've got to know, you know those small little loaves that you gave me. You know those couple of fish that you gave me. I, Mama, I know that it wasn't much. And please, before you get upset, I want you to know that I shared it, but I gave it to Jesus. And look, at, look at, before you say anything, he gave me a basket to bring home to us as well. That small, little, insignificant boy with small, nothing loaves and fish. A little bit was all that he had. But Jesus says, that's all that I need. Somebody said amen. In Matthew 17, 20, Jesus says the faith the size of a mustard seed. I brought some mustard seed. I want to show you one of them. To be honest, they're so small I could just close my fingers and tell you there's one there. I have a mustard seed right here. It's so small, so tiny, so insignificant. My mom, at seven years of age, she wasn't raised in church, but there was a love of God inside of her. My grandma was already in her 20s before she ever got saved and experienced God in such a life-transforming way. But my mom had been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. She had been filled with the Spirit of God. And at seven years of age, they were there at my mom's house, which is my grandma's house. And, and her best friend, Irene, was there. And, and they, my mom was there talking to her about God. And, and listen, if you want the Holy Ghost, you can get the Holy Ghost too. Like, it is so awesome being filled with the Spirit of God. It doesn't matter, you know, anything you've gone through. And she's there talking to her. And they said, well, let's have church right here. So they get the stuffed animals. They line up the stuffed animals so they got some members. You know, so, they, so they line them up. And my grandma walks by, and they're there playing church, singing a song. And my grandma's like, oh, you know, how cute. And, and she keeps going. And, and a few minutes pass and everything. And then my grandma comes back by, and she's walking. And she's like, oh, whoa, whoa. She stops, and she comes back, and she's, she's listening in. And Irene, my mom's best friend at seven years of age, was filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking tongues in the living room. There was nobody that was laying on hands or preaching or, or demanding or you know, enforcing or anything else right there. She got filled with the Spirit of God. God is not limited. God is not confined. You don't have to be in a certain building. You could be by yourself in your vehicle and feel the presence of God begin to talk to you. You could be out at the pier, out at Battery Park, and you're just looking at the water, and God begins to work on you, move on you, wherever it is. And so... That little tiny mustard seed of faith that my mom had and, and that Irene now had, she grew up, she got older, she lived for God. She had two boys that became close, my, my two of my closest best friends. Their names was Georgie and Nico. And as time passed and my friends got older and, my, uh, and Irene, my mom's friend, got older, she got diagnosed with cancer. And all that she had was that small little mustard seed of faith. It wasn't anything big. It wasn't anything great. She didn't command mountains to move or trees to be uprooted. It, it was just a small 
little mustard seed of faith. But with that small little mustard seed of faith, she told her boys, listen, you need to know something. Don't lose your faith. Don't give up hope. No matter what happens to me, if I don't get healed in my body right now, don't ever stop believing in God. Don't ever stop pursuing God. Don't ever stop going after God. What has happened to me is not God's fault. And if he takes my life, you've got to continue to fight the fight. I will say I would love to sit here or tell, stand up here and tell you that she was healed miraculously, but that is not what happened. She ended up passing away a couple of years ago, but both of her boys had also had that small little mustard seed of faith. It was all that they've got. They didn't have much more. It wasn't like they were left, you know, millions of dollars or anything, but there was something that was worth so much more. Just a mustard seed of faith. And they both live for God and they are both ministers in their churches right now. Why? Because of a mustard seed of faith. By a show of hands, how many here have not been filled with the Holy Ghost? We're not going to come lay hands on you right now. But if you've never been filled with the Holy Ghost, it's fine. You can raise your hand. You know, we all raised our hand at some point. Yep, okay, yep, all right. Anybody else has not been filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues? You may have felt God. You may, may have impressed upon you. But you have not spoken in tongues. And you're like, hey, I, I haven't experienced that. I would like to. Okay, that sounds great. That's great. We got, we got people full of the Holy Ghost. We're going to have a great time today. Amen? Amen. Brother Jordan, if you, could, if you could help me real fast, put some hand sanitizer on. I want you to give me a favor. I want you to give this real fast to this brother right here. Go ahead and take that. Sister Nini, Danita, if you, can, if you can help me. If I get your help also. Come here, I want you guys to put some sanitizer on. This is brand new, and I tell you, these seeds did not come from China. Okay, in case you're like, where do you get them seeds from? These are actually mustard seeds. These have been ordered. I've actually had them for quite some time. But I, I, if, you, if you want one, I want you to go ahead and just raise your hand. You just raise your hand. If you do not want one, keep your hands down. But if you do want a seed, I want you to go ahead and just raise your hand. I want you to go ahead and... And I want you to just start giving one of these little seeds. I want you guys to see how small, how insignificant, how tiny, how, how nothing. Go ahead and pour these. You can pass them around. How nothing that these little mustard seeds are. Okay, raise your hand if you want a seed. Go ahead. We should see a bunch of hands going up right now. Just a little seed. You could toss it. You could plant it. You could do whatever you want with it. If you drop it, nobody would be able to see it. So if you're worried about you know, losing it, it'll be fine. Uh, it's not going to leave a big imprint inside your pocket if you forget about it. If it gets in the washer, you promise you won't even realize it or know it. It's not going to spread. So raise your hand. If you do not want one, you keep your hand down, and that's fine. And we make sure you do not get one. So if you do want one, again, I want you to raise your hand. And while, while you're getting one of those, <clears throat> I want to share a story with you guys. I don't know about you, but I love stories. It's just how I learn. I, I love stories. There was, a, there was an Indian chief. This was a, an ancient tribe, and there was an Indian chief. He was, he was a, a, a chief that was... He was he, he was just very good. He was righteous. He was a just chief. He was a chief that always kind of prided himself on doing what was right. He always wanted to make a good decision. He, he always wanted to just let all the people know that he's got the best interests of the entire tribe. He's not favored with family. He's not, you know, limited. Like, this was a great, great, great chief. And one day, as they're experiencing this drought that went on for a period of time, they uh, there were some things that were disappearing. There were some things that were stealing. Somebody was stealing food, and, and it just got to the point where the chief had to pass a law. He said, whoever gets caught stealing is going to go to the post in the center of the tribe, and they are going to get whipped. We've got so-and-so that's going to be doing the whipping, and you're going to get lashings. There's going to be several lashings. Do not get caught stealing. Do not steal. We have to make sure for the good of the tribe we all look out for each other. And to the chief's surprise, to the chief's detriment, to the chief's uh, just, just complete shock and awe, the next day there was somebody that got caught stealing. It was his mom who was old, she was frail, she was fragile, she was weak. The chief knew there was no way that his mother was going to survive these lashings. So he had a choice to make. Was, I gonna, was he going to continue to be the chief that was just, that was righteous? Was he going to continue to be the chief that stood for what was right as he had been for so many years? Or was he going to make an exception, something that he prided himself on never taking favorites? But he knew that he had to make the decision. And so he 
He said, you're going to have to tie her up. And sure enough, they put her right in the middle of the tribe. They tied her to the post. Her wrists are tied. The one that's going to conduct the punishment gets out there. He gets the whip. The mom is screaming and she's crying and she's yelling out for her son. Please stop them, please. You know I can't survive. There's, you know there's no way that I can take this. I, I'm sorry. Please just stop it. And, and the chief again, he had to stand back. And, and he, you know, there was nothing. It was out of his hands. This was something that she deserved. This was something that she brought upon herself. And so as the one that was there getting ready to conduct the, the punishment, the lash, the whip, he is there. And, and he begins to pull back. And, and he's getting ready now to swing with all full force and begin the lashings and as he begins to come down the chief throws off his jacket and he runs to his mom covers up the mom and the one that was conducting the punishment came down with all of the lashings wham one after another after another after another the mom was there screaming but the son was there holding her saying I've got you it's gonna be okay that you ever wondered how much Jesus loves you is exactly what he did when he went to the cross and he knew you would not be able to survive the punishment that you deserve because Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There was no way that you could survive that. There was no way that I could survive that. So he covered you up and said, I will take your place. You may not have much, and I understand that. But as I said in Romans 12, 3, that God has given everyone a measure of faith. And in Matthew 17, 20, he says, I will give you, everyone, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed. If you've still got that mustard seed, go ahead and hold it up. It's not much, I know. I've got one right here. Look, at some of you already lost it. Like, mine's already gone. I don't even know where mine is anymore. I think I put it in my pocket, but it's gone. It is so small. That's it. If you just have this amount of faith, this much, that God, I don't have much. Like, I am broken. Like, I've messed up. Like, you see my past. You see my failures. You see my shortcomings. You see my heartaches. You see every time that I'm trying to do good and instead I fall flat on my face and I mess up. And, and you see everything. But God, I don't have much. All that I have is just a little bit. And Jesus is saying, I'm not asking you to be full of faith. I'm asking you to have just a little bit. Of faith. I want to go through another story of faith real fast. Put up Luke 8, verse 43. Luke 8, 43. I'm watching the time. It says, And a woman, having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. Verse 45. And Jesus said, uh, uh, verse 44, sorry, came behind him and touched the border of his garment and immediately her issue of blood stanched. Verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me when all denied Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. Verse 47, and when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And lastly, verse 48, and he said unto her daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Go back to verse 43. I like to read through the story and then we come back and then we hit on each of the verses. And a woman, having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. In this verse, verse 43, we are introduced to a new character. A woman that had been suffering for 12 years with an ailment that the Bible doesn't even give us a, the, the prognosis. It doesn't even give us the exact you know, diagnosis. doesn't tell us exactly what it was. But says that she had an issue of blood and for 12 years she suffered with this. It also tells us that she spent all of her living upon physicians and nobody could heal her. Now, I don't know about you, but it seems like all the time I've got people that they haven't even talked to me in years, you know, 10, 15 years I'm talking, like from high school. And then all of a sudden they come in and they're trying to sell me something. 
I'm not even going to say what it is because some of you guys may be selling it. But, you know, trying to sell me a supplement, a shake, a wrap, a pill, a, uh, you know, something. Like, I, you haven't even talked to me in 15 years to ask me how I'm doing, my kids are doing, you're trying to sell me something? So this is where this lady was. She literally tried everything that she could. Every pill, every wrap, every cream, every prescription, whatever it is that any of her friends would tell her or family that would tell her. Every doctor she visited and nobody was able to help her. Now, back then, it wasn't like now, where if you were sick, you could still come in and, you know, hey, just put on a mask and kind of maybe sit in the corner or something. No, back then, if you were sick, especially if it had to do with blood, you were considered unclean. So you were separated, you were isolated, you were segregated, you were completely separate from the entire rest of the community. That town would have nothing to do with you. Nope, you're over there. If you even came near people, you'd have to tell them that you're unclean. And if anybody touched you, they were now unclean. So nobody would touch you. Nobody would come near you. So this is where we see this woman being introduced. She was hurting. She was in pain. She was alone. She was forsaken. She was abandoned. There was nobody to encourage her. There was nobody to motivate her. Yet somewhere along the way, she heard about this Jesus. They, she heard about this one that, listen, I... Uh, Ma'am, I don't know if you've heard anything, but there is somebody, he's opened some blinded eyes, he's healed deaf ears, like, uh, you know, maybe you should check him out, Jesus is coming through. And she heard about this Jesus, I don't know if it was, she, she was sitting outside the gate and happened to heard people talking, but it was enough to spark enough interest. She knew that she was already hurting, she knew that she was already broken, she knew that she already spent all of her money. She also knew that she could not touch Jesus because then she would make him unclean. And if he was really doing all of these things that she said, she did not want to be the one to stop that or to ruin that. If he's touching all these people and healing all these people, I'm so, so terrified because if I touch him, then he's going to be unclean. And so go ahead and go to the very next verse, verse 44. And we see it says... She came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood stanched, or it dried up, or it stopped. There was something that absolutely happened. It was like a lightning bolt that went through her body from the top of her head to the sole of her feet that caused her to understand and realize, I have just been healed. She goes again and she touches the hem of his garment, like the port of his garment. She didn't even want to touch him again. But there was something inside of her. It wasn't much. It was just a little bit of faith that said, if I can just crawl my way to him, if I could just push through the dust, the dirt, she's there on the ground making her way. There are people that are kicking her, but she stood up so she knew what he was wearing. And she begins to crawl through the multitude and the crowd. And, and they're kicking her and nudging her. It's not even on purpose. They're in sandals getting dust and dirt all over her face and, and her mouth. But there was something in inside of her that said, I don't care what is going to try to stop me. I'm going to get to Jesus. And so as she touches him, immediately healing began to flow through her body where it just absolutely shook her. She now stood up and, and oh my God, there are tears that continue to flow and I have been healed. Go to verse 45, the next verse. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou who touched me? Peter is saying, listen, Jesus, you are surrounded. Like there's literally thousands of people. They're all pushing on you. They're all touching you. They're all trying to, you know, get attention and, and you know, tell their friends, and guess what, who I touched today? I touched Jesus. You know, it's pretty cool. Like he didn't even see me, and I hit him on his back, uh, of his back, and I was like, hey, Jesus, you know, and, and uh, you know, hey, John, want me to tell you hi? And he goes, so, hey, James, you know, I told him that I told him it, and John, I told him hi and for you. And, and so they just wanted to brag. A lot of them were there just to be able to brag. I mean, this was Jesus. This was one that was blowing people's minds. But something happened, and the disciples are there saying, how can you say that? Because look at you, you're surrounded. And it says they all denied. No, I mean, I didn't. But Jesus, again, listen to what he said. He said, who touched me? Immediately, this lady got terrified. 
Oh, God, if everyone sees that I touch Jesus, he is now unclean. She is absolutely terrified. She's shaken. She just got healing that she had been after for over 12 years. She had been praying about it. She didn't have much, but all she had was just a tiny little bit of mustard seed of faith. And if I could just touch him, this is all that I've got if I could do it. And, and now I'm going to, oh, gosh, now he's asking. And, and the thoughts that must have been going through her mind as he said, who touched me? And everybody denies it. Go to the next next verse and Jesus said no you don't understand somebody have touched me for I perceive that virtue or power is gone out of me there was somebody that got a hold of me that said I want to be different I don't want to leave this place the same but I want to get a hold of Jesus because he's the only one that can keep me he's the only one that can heal me he's the only one that can touch me he's the only one that can satisfy me he's the only one that can feel me Go to the next verse. It says this. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she tried to hide. Well, I don't, I don't want them to know that it was me. So she's hiding in the back. But the multitude just kind of splits. And she finds herself right there. And she's standing up. And she's looking around. And tears are streaming down her face. And, oh, God, this is it. What if I lose my miracle now? What if I lose my healing? Like, I, I can't do this anymore. I don't know if I could make it another day. I, God, I just don't know. And she's there. And it says she came trembling and falling down before him she then went she's crying tears are flowing down her face she throws herself at the feet of Jesus it says and she declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately so she's there she's almost trying to make an excuse before everybody I, I, I want everybody to know I know that I'm unclean I know that I'm unworthy but you've got to understand for 12 years I've been hurting I've been in pain I've been alone I didn't try to touch him or push him I just touched his clothes so please don't think he's dirty or unclean he, he didn't touch me it wasn't even on purpose and she's crying she's trying to make an excuse for everybody and, and how she was healed immediately but you've got to know that I just came with what little bit that I had and he healed me immediately Immediately. Let's keep going. Go to the next verse. And he said unto her. Mm, and he said unto her. This is, this is, this is like James 4, 8. That says, if you draw near to God, that God will draw near to you. So up to this point, we see the lady with the issue of blood that has done her part. And she has drawn near to God. And now we are about to see God do his part as he now draws near to her. And so it says, and he said unto her, daughter, be of good comfort. The words that she had been longing to hear, she hadn't been a part of a family in over 12 years. And yet just like that, it wasn't a, a word of condemnation to say, I know what you did before this sickness. I know that you deserve this. or I, I know what it is that you have gone through. He wasn't condemning her. He wasn't making an example of her with everybody that was around. But he says, daughter, those words, he says, no, I've got you. Like not only am I going to say lady or ma'am, but daughter and automatically brought her into the family and let her feel that presence, that warmth that she had desired for so long. And then he continues because then he looks at her still and he says, thy faith, that little bit that you had, that little tiny mustard seed of faith was enough. I know it was all that you had. I know you didn't think that you were going to make it another day. I know that this was your last try. I know that you had just put your trust in me. I want you to know that that little bit of faith, that mustard seed of faith was enough. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. As we all stand and as the musicians begin to come forward, I want to share this last story with you. The Olympics were taking place in 1992. The location was Barcelona, Spain. It came down to a 400 meter dash and there was a man that was already the one that was going to be the winner. Everybody knew that this guy had the potential, he had the talent, he had the skill. So he was the one that was favored to win. His name was Derek Redman. Derek 
had already done good in previous Olympics. Derek had even messed up in previous Olympics. So if there was anybody that was determined to win this, they knew that it was going to be Derek. Derek and his dad had made a pact that, listen, no matter what happens, you're going to do it. You're going you're gonna to take it. You're going to cross it. And, you know, no matter what, we, we've got this son. And Jim Redmond, his dad, was there talking to his son Derek. And, and Derek just wanted a medal. He didn't even care what color it was. It could be gold, it could be silver, it could be bronze. It doesn't matter what it is. And so he was there and he said, well, I got it, Dad. Yep, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. So the race starts. And sure enough, Derek Redman is out there. Like this guy is booking it. 50 meters, 100 meters, 150 meters, 200 meters. Like it was clear, this is going to be the winner. All of the work, all of the effort, all of the time, everything that he had put into it up to this point was now about to take place. But as he's approaching about the 175 meters that was left, he tore his hamstring. And you could watch the video, you could YouTube it, it's a crazy video. But he tore it and he said he felt like it was a gunshot and he starts limping and then he falls to the ground. The man that was destined to win this, the man that was favored to win this, the man that had worked so hard to win this, now found himself in complete and total pain, crying in agony, crying out, I can't make it, I'm too weak, I, I barely have any strength in my body, this is it, I can't believe this is how this Olympics is going to end. The medics are running out there. They're bringing the stretcher. They're now telling him, you've got to get on the stretcher. Let's go. Let's get you out. And and all of the crowd was there, and they're watching as the man is now getting ready to pass and, boom, win the race. And he is there, and he's telling them, no, 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 I I can't go. I I can't stop yet. I've, I've got to just go. He's pushing them away. They said, no, Derek, you've got to get on here. And so he starts going and he's limping with one leg and he's hopping and he's trying. But with every step, it is killing him in pain. And his dad is up at the very back of the stadium near where they had the torch just the day before. And his dad, Jim Redman, is back there. And he sees his boy completely struggling, hurting, limping. And he says, I've got to get to my boy. So he begins to run down the stadium. He's pushing onlookers out of the way. He hops the gate that is separating the the, the masses, the crowds, and, and he begins to run. Security tries to stop him. They're chasing him. One tries to grab him. He pushes him out of the way. He says, you don't understand. My boy is out there. And so he's running. He grabs Derek, his son, and Derek thought this was another person that was trying to stop him. He says, I can't, don't, please, just, just let me go. And Derek, the, Derek is there crying, and, and Jim comes alongside him. He says, son, it's me, Dad. You, you don't have to do this. No, Dad, I, I do have to do this. I've only got a little bit of strength, but I've got to do this. And, and so the dad is holding me. He says, then we are going to do this together. So he grabs him, and he's walking And Derek Redman has his face in his dad's shoulder and he's crying in complete pain. He's crying in complete agony. He's crying because it's so severe. He's almost dragging his leg and he's trying. And his dad says, I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. As they get ready to to close out, as they get ready to come up to the the very end where the line was, the dad says, I'm going to let you go now. You're going to finish this. You've got this. So Derek begins to go. 65,000 onlookers didn't care who had just won first place. They didn't care who won second place. They were now shouting in complete unity, roaring out for this guy that wasn't stopping. He didn't have much, just a little bit. But it was enough because when he made it past the finish line, he fell down. And the crowd was just completely crazy. They lost it. And the dad ran back there and said, you did it. You don't need a lot, just a little bit. You don't need to be full of faith. You don't need to have the faith that moves the mountains. You don't need to have the faith that that you could just walk in the spiritual world. But if you just have a little bit of faith, 
God can touch you. God can fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost. God can heal your mind. God can bring peace to your body. God can remove the chaos. God can stop the storm. God can do all of this with simply words of speaking. Peace be still. As he wraps his arms around you, he says, listen, I see that all you've got is a little bit and you feel broken and you feel insignificant and you feel unworthy and you've got your past and you've got your mistakes and you've got your struggles and you've got your heartache but all you've got is just a little bit of strength left inside of you just a little bit of faith inside of you that is enough as we all lift up our hands all across this building right now that's it that's it go ahead if you have that little bit of that mustard seed that little bit of faith if you could raise that right now God I don't have much this is all that I've got God I'm tired. I've tried. I've messed up. I'm going to open these altars right now. And if there is something inside of you that says, I have got to get to the feet of Jesus. I have got to get the Holy Ghost. I have got to get my healing. I have got to get my miracle. That I encourage you, come forward right now. We will put sanitizer on. We'll put masks on. We'll do whatever we have to. But if you want something today, then come on up to the front because we're going to make sure that it happens. But if you are fine with where you are, then continue to hold up that little mustard seed of faith and say, God, here I am. I'm broken. I've messed up. I've struggled. I've got heartaches. I've got personal issues. I've got family issues. I've got spiritual spiritual issues. I've got emotional issues. I've got all of these things that are going on. But here I am in my brokenness. Here I am in my pain. Here I am in my agony. Here I am with my past. All across this building, if we could just begin to repent right now. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my failures. Forgive me for everything that I've done that was wrong. Forgive me for everything that I've tried to do on my own strength, on my own accord, by my own whatever it is that I've got. But I put it all at your feet right now. I surrender everything to you right now. That's it. Go ahead. Repentance all across this building. That's it. You may have been born in this. You may have been raised in this. This may be your first time. But when you are repenting, even the angels of heaven take notice and say, look at this one repenting. Look at this one that's making up their mind. Look at this one that is now serious about this. That's it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. started getting dark it started getting later she told her friends I've got to get back home now before it gets too late so she left she was by herself she begins to walk there was a shortcut an alley that would get her to her house a lot faster so she's taking that shortcut and as she's taking that shortcut she sees a man that was down that alley and immediately fear began to hit her body she began to get scared. She seen this man at the end of this alley and she just, she, she didn't have anything else. And, and God, please, I, all I can do is trust in you. All I can do is have faith in you. Please protect me. Please send your angels to be with me. I need you. Help me just get through this with nothing happening. And, and she walks and sure enough, she walks right past this guy in that alley. She makes it home. The next day she's there and she's reading the local news and she found out that there was a woman that was attacked in that same alley 20 minutes after she had left. She began to cry. Tears were flowing down her head and flowing down her eyes. And, and she says, oh my gosh, like God, that could have been me. I, I've got to see if I can help. I, I've got to call up the police department. And, and she calls up the police department. They ask her to come down and, and she gives them a description. They say, if we catch him, will you be able to identify him? She says, yes, I will be able to identify him. So they have the lineup. Right away, she picks the guy and sure enough, 
when they come to him and they say that you were recognized as the man in that way, he, he automatically broke down. He admitted to it. The cops come to her and they said, thank you very much for your help and for what you contributed because sure enough, he admitted to it. He was guilty. He admits to it. And, and she's still there. She's crying. And they said, is there anything we can do for you? She said, yes. Ask them this one question. Ask him why he didn't attack me, the girl, 20 minutes before. So he said, sure, we, we will ask her. So these detectives go over there and they're asking him. There was somebody that walked down the alleyway 20 minutes before this lady. Why did you not attack her? He said, because she was not alone. There was two big men that were walking, one on each side. When you feel like you are by yourself, let me tell you, you are not alone. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you feel like you're going through a trial, when you feel like you're going through a fire, when you feel like you're going through a den of lions, he's got you. Just that little bit of faith is all that it takes that begins to move heaven and move earth. And he says, that's all that you need because I will never leave you by yourself. I will never leave you abandoned. In your moment of weakness, in your moment of isolation, in your moment of pain, I still have you. Jesus, that's it. Go ahead and open your hearts right now. Open your hands, open your minds. He's got something for you. I've got you. I've got plans for you. As he told Jeremiah before, I formed you in your mother's womb. I knew you and ordained you to be a prophet. I will never just drop you by yourself. I will never leave you in your darkest moment. I will never just say, all right, I'm done. Or this has been enough. This is far enough. This is as far as I'm going. But I'm going to continue to hold you and to guide you. Okay, go ahead. That's it. Now, don't stop. Go ahead. If you haven't touched him yet today, then touch him. If you haven't gotten a hold of his garment yet, then get a hold of his garment. If you haven't felt him yet, then feel him. Don't stop. We don't know when our last time will be. We don't know when our last opportunity will be. You've seen how quick they shut down the churches. There are churches and friends and family I've got that are still not even able to gather together. So while you've got other people that are like-minded with faith that are willing to pray with you and pray for you and pray next to you, then you better take advantage of every opportunity that it is that you have because you don't know when you will have it again. Stretch forth your hand to somebody else you see praying. Pray for somebody else. Pray for somebody who's joined us online. We may not even know that they're watching at the moment, but, but pray for someone. If you're not praying for yourself, pray for someone right now. In Jesus' name.
there anybody with a little mustard seed, seed of faith to join together? They're going to believe the Lord's going to fill them with the Holy Ghost right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, build up faith. In Jesus' name, build up faith. off to pastor to close us out with a word of prayer. I just want to say again, thank you for everybody that came this morning, that watched online, that'll watch this recorded. Thank you for our youth and young adults that participated. Uh, it's, I've said it many, many times, but again, publicly to every parent, and it, although we don't, me and my wife don't work directly with the Sunday school kids as youth pastors, to be able to, to help guide and to be an example for every single young person in this church is such a privilege that we don't take for granted. We don't take for granted at all. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you parents for entrusting us all of the leadership entrusting us to be able to lead and guide spiritually and to be able to participate with each and every one of you. We're so blessed. We're so thankful. do this at the beginning of each school year if you have just a moment. Uh, parents, if you are if you feel that it's safe, um, we're going to ask our young people if they could come and 
if they could stay six feet apart, wear a mask if you have one, if you feel like your children, it's safe for them to come up here. We want to pray over our children before they begin their school year. If your children feel you want to keep them in the pew with you, that's fine. We're still going to pray over them. But if we could have our young folks up here, what a beautiful message. What a beautiful, powerful message. Y'all spread out good. If you're family, you can stick together, but spread way out. We want to make sure everybody is uh, safe. As they're coming forward and, and you're here, just give me your attention for just a moment. I know we all want to get to lunch. <laughs> but when the Holy Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts, in the, the, the church, the first church service in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, there was a lot going on, like in our services. There was people, you know, it was chaos. There was people speaking in tongues. There were just, uh, nobody knew what was going on. You know, Peter had to stand up and kind of preach a sermon and, and let everybody know what was going on. And Peter, the, the people that were there and were confused, there's people look, acting like they're drunk and they're speaking in tongues. There's all this chaos going on. They said that they were drunk. And Peter was like, no, they're not drunk. It's too early for that. Peter reached way back in the prophecies of Joel. And he said that uh, these aren't drunk like you think, but this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. He said that in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons, everybody say sons. And your daughters, everybody say daughters shall prophesy and your young men everybody say young men shall see visions and your old men somebody say old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens somebody say handmaidens i will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy that covered everybody old people young people children slaves servants everyone and what's beautiful about prophecy is, you know, Joel prophesied about it hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. Peter said, this is what Joel was talking about. And we can even declare it today that, yes, Joel's prophecies are still coming to pass. And it's still for anybody that has just a little bit. Just a little bit. It doesn't rule out any of our young people. It doesn't matter how young you are or how old you are or if you're starting college or if you're starting kindergarten. The Bible says, and that, that's why Brother Howie could say, you know, the testimony of his mother receiving the Holy Spirit so young, and her friend, and him, and his son, and my daughters received the Holy Spirit whenever they were uh, quite young. Why? Because it's for all of us. It's for young and old. So you're not discounted. Your little bit counts in the kingdom of God, and your little bit's going to count in your school, whether you're online or you're walking into the building, your little bit counts. You can change the atmosphere of that Zoom meeting or that classroom or wherever you're going, that college campus, you can change it because you have got God's spirit, God's power, and God's promises on you. And you may walk into that building thinking, I feel like I'm the only, only Christian in my classroom. Guess what? It only takes a little bit for each classroom. I'm the, I feel like I'm the only Pentecostal on my, on my campus. Guess what? It only takes a little bit. It only takes just a little bit, kids, young people. It only takes one. That's what I love about, you know, when Sister Sean came and gave the testimony of Favor Foundation. You know, somebody didn't uh, tell Sister Sean, oh, I got a million bucks. Why don't you go and start this foundation? No. Sister Sean had a, a, a one or two bucks and said, I just want to start something. I want to help people. I want to feed people. I want to give. And she started giving, and God started multiplying it. And the more she gave, the more God gave. And the more people that she helped, the more God gave for her to help more people. So it only takes a little bit, church. It only takes a little bit, young person. So whatever you got, let's just lift our hands and give it to the Lord. And you're going to be a hero on your campus, in your classroom. God's going to do something great. Church, can you pray over our young people for just a few minutes? We don't have to touch them. 
We're just going to pray over them. Lord Jesus, let your spirit be upon them. God, let them shine a light. There is so much negativity going on in the world right now. Disease is rampant. Doubt is rampant. Anxiety and depression are rampant. Young people, especially our young people, are going through tremendous changes, and they don't even know why. And their in their anxiety is being passed on to our young people and our youth and our children. God, we speak against that anxiety. We speak against those spirits of confusion and depression and all those things that would come upon them because so much stuff has changed in their lives in the last few months. Lord, we pray your perfect peace. Church, can you pray peace over our youth? Can you pray peace over our children? Can you pray that God would send peace and strength to their minds and their spirits? They need it right now. We we didn't have to face challenges like they're facing. God, send your strength upon them. Lord, when their fellow classmates are sharing distress with them and anxiety with them, let them speak peace from their mouths. Let them speak peace that comes from your spirit, Lord. Let them pass on to those around them that the Lord is good. The Lord has everything under control. They don't have anything to worry about. God will take care of it all. Everything is in his hands. He has never left the throne. He still rules. He is still our creator, and he is still in control. And God will bring peace into those situations through our youth, through our children, through our young adults, wherever they go. God, let them be the ones that carry peace in this gospel to those around them. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Church, pray with me right now in Jesus' name. Just invoke the name of Jesus over them. Just say it in Jesus' name. Cover them. In Jesus' name, protect them. In Jesus' name, bring them peace. In Jesus' name, let's invoke the powerful name of Jesus, our healer, our strength, our deliverer, the one who knows and cares. In Jesus' name, cover them. In Jesus' name, send angels to walk about them. In Jesus' name, send your protection over them. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you. God bless you, kids. Our young people, our young adults, you, you, you folks are so special to us. God bless you so much. Thank you, church, for being here. Thank you for staying safe. Put on your mask. Kind of keep your distance from each other as you're walking out. See you next Sunday. Invite someone to either join you online or in the sanctuary. We still got a balcony we can sit in. We want everyone that needs the baptism of the Holy Ghost and to be baptized in Jesus' name to hear the gospel preached by Brother Mike Easter next Sunday, our evangelist. And if you were here this morning to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, come and let me know. If you would like to be baptized in Jesus' name, we have a baptismal that's ready to go, and we will do that for you today. God bless you. You're dismissed. Let's give a hand to our evangelist, Brother uh, Howard, and his lovely wife and family. God's blessings upon them as they go back home in Jesus' name.